So firstly, welcome to everybody. This talk isn't going to be about anything uh, revolutionary. Um, we've been operating our current monitoring stack since 2010, and it's, it's really been incremental progress. And so this, this talk's more about our evolution in monitoring and where we're trying to get to and some of the learnings that we've had along the way. Uh, for some of you, it won't be directly applicable, uh, especially if you're in a kind of a smaller shop at the moment. Uh, if you're in a mid-size, uh, I have some warnings for you. Hopefully, somebody will get something out of it. So firstly, this is what happens when you tell your team that you're going to give a talk. Uh, and uh, the, the one uh, who looks the best in this shot is the one who did it. Uh, and the one who is Trinity is one of my managers, and I told him he's going to be all over the internet, so he's very happy about that. So firstly, this is, this is pretty much what our stack looks like. So uh, at the moment, we have 825 million metrics. Uh, these are mostly generated from Java applications, uh, but also a lot from non-Java applications and things like um, operating system metrics as well. Uh, Anything that's non-Java uh, comes in through our HTTP API. Uh, we actually just rewrote that in Go this year. Uh, it handles, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of QPS on a handful of boxes, like three, I think. Uh, the Java applications, uh, they all come in through Kafka. The HTTP API actually comes in through Kafka as well, eventually. And then they end up on our metrics collectors. Um, so we actually have, I don't know, a couple of thousand boxes with SSDs. Uh, uh, split between our new metrics collection stack and our old metrics collection stack, which we're, we're trying to get to our new, new state. So we do about uh, 10 million metrics a second. Uh, it doesn't quite add up in the math because the, uh, some of them aren't, uh, mostly we're mainly, some of them aren't. The endpoint that serves our metrics is called metric server. It's also written in Go. We just wrote that, uh, we just released that this year. Um, it, somehow accidentally scaled from uh, 500,000 QPS at the start of the year to something like 1.2 million QPS at the moment, and uh, we didn't notice. Uh, we haven't uplifted it at all. Uh, it still looks kind of bored on the number of machines that we have it on. <laughs> so, uh, and part of that is because we replaced our Python API with our Go API. And then we have uh, the InGraphs uh, system, which is basically our visualization system. It's also the, uh, the place you go to to see uh, what's alerting uh, somewhat. Uh, and we have, at the moment, about 27,000 dashboards. Uh, these are mostly manually curated. They're all curated by people, but uh, probably half of them are uh, automatically generated in some fashion. Uh, and then we process about 340,000 alerts a minute. So uh, we actually have a lot more triggers than this, probably in the multiple million range. Uh, but these are the ones that we actually actively process as a, as a group. When alerts go off, we have a system internally. Uh, it's called Iris. We've had at least one SRE who had to explain who Iris was to his wife in the middle of the night. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, th this is basically our system for like nagging the crap out of people. Uh, hopefully not nagging the crap out of people, but that, that's really up to them. Uh, and on-call is our system for looking up who's on-call. Uh, the combination of the two is, uh, you could probably think of as something like PagerDuty. Uh, Nurse is our order remediation system. Uh, if you go to the order remediation meetups, um, I'm sure some of you have bumped into BCS, who's the guy who kind of thought up this for us. Uh, Nurse actually just recently joined my team. Uh, was actually in a different team until about two months ago. And then Inmon is our external monitoring system. So uh, this is sort of a catch point like system, except that instead of five minute frequencies, uh, Inmon tests it anything from uh, second granularity through to uh, the average is actually 15, but uh, we, we can test it at anything in between. Um, so just a shameless plug, uh, two of those things I mentioned, Iris and OnCall, uh, we open sourced earlier this year. Um, so if you uh, want to hit up either of those, uh, please feel free, uh, contribute, we'd be happy to help you out. So this is where we came from. So in 2010, uh, we had 100,000 metrics across the entire site. 2010 was two years before I joined, and when I joined, we were at about, I think, 50 million members. 
Uh, so I guess we were at like 10 or something uh, back then. Uh, we had five minutes between data points. Um, I can't remember what system we were using, but I know that it was falling over with that load. Uh, there were two engineers on the team, and uh, we didn't do direct escalations at all. We had a knock, and that was the only thing we used. So today, uh, 825 million metrics. This fluctuates a bit, but it's actually up 100% from last year. Uh, we do 850 billion writes a day, uh, three, 35 billion read operations a day. Uh, we actually took an internal open source approach to Iris. Uh, we basically said we're going to write this as a generic platform for handling escalations, and anybody in the company who has an application that needs uh, phone calls or SMS or anything like that can, can use the system. And uh, we went from uh, just the one system, which was auto alerts, using it to uh, 50, and that was actually when I gave this last, which was a few months ago. I think there's probably more like 55, 56 now. We do about 2,000 code reviews a year at the moment in my team. Uh, uh, I should uh, caveat this entire slide deck was uh, prepared for an internal uh, thing, so some of this I probably should have vetted a little bit more before I uh, started talking about it, but whatever. Um, we have 13 back-end engineers now uh, and uh, three front-end engineers. Uh, this has actually just changed as well because we just got the nurse team, which is another four. So. Uh, so some of our challenges, we have a lot. I have three. Uh, almost every outage for us is a major. Um, and the basic problem is that uh, if you're the monitoring system for the site, if you're down, people are blind, and people get really upset really fast. Um, I think we have one person from LinkedIn here. Uh, they probably know what I'm talking about. The entire system almost entirely is self-service. Uh, self-service is. Uh, great. I highly encourage people to move towards being self-service. It's generally better for the people writing the software, but only if you really think about what you're doing. And uh, this year, it has not been good. Uh, it has been honestly very bad. Uh, we have grown much, much faster than anticipated. Uh, our growth in metrics this year is five times higher than it was last year. Uh, and a lot of that is because we've done a lot of re-architecting of our site. People have been both uh, more thoughtful and less thoughtful about the kind of metrics they're producing, uh, and both of those has produced more metrics. Uh, and we have a lot of historical baggage. This thing started in 2010. Uh, a lot of the current stack was written 2010, 2011 by uh, two engineers, that are uh, one of which is still on my team. Uh, one of them was an intern at the time. Uh, and the other one was an ELT. Well, the code is amazing. Uh, we're running a lot of the same code that we're running today that we were running back in 2010. We've done a lot to get it there. Like, a lot of it has just kind of limped along while we're uh, rewriting some of it, in, uh, especially in Go. Go is uh, um, our poster child for making things go faster at the moment. So this is, this is kind of our the overall vision for our team, uh, what's bringing us along uh, in, this, in this revolution. So uh, if, you're, if you're looking for evolutionary, uh, uh, this, is, this is kind of where we are. If you're looking for revolutionary, the honeycomb talk is probably more uh, where it's at. Uh, uh, one of the things I want to just say before we get to this is that, so my team is just one of a bunch of different teams who differ, who monitor on different things inside the site. So we monitor on the operational side of things. We also monitor uh, releases. We monitor our call graph uh, for uh, changes. Uh, we monitor based on like uh, real user metrics that we gather from browsers. We, me we monitor on uh, site speed changes. We, we monitor on a, a whole ton of things. And some of them use different systems. Uh, some of them use our system. Uh, some of them use our system in ways that we didn't intend them to use our system, uh, which is uh, good and bad, unintended consequences for us. So we have, a, we have a few kind of founding principles. One is leverage before features. So um, we're at, I don't know, 350 SREs now. Uh, SREs tend to be the ones who build most of our monitoring tooling or tooling around our monitoring. Um, we can't build everything, and we're definitely not the last bastion of good ideas in the company. We have a lot of good ideas, and uh, it uh, from the time we have a good idea to the time we can bring it into production with the throughput that we have can be a fairly long time. 
we tend to focus on giving people the features they need to be able to write their own monitoring tooling, uh, whether it's to uh, be able to onboard them things themselves, to look for anomalies that are happening in our site, to reuse the data in better ways. Those are all things we care about before implementing new features in our core part of our stack. We like implementing new features. Implementing new features is, is super fun, but uh, it's, it's kind of more important that people don't get uh, bored of waiting for the new features and can, can just get on with their lives and do things. So operability is necessary to, to be able to iterate on the stack. Uh, and this is something that we've learned the hard way a lot in the last couple of years. Uh, the, the current stack is very brittle. Like, it's, it's amazing being able to roll out completely new uh, code because the old code base uh, gets very brittle over time. You end up hacking on hacks to keep the level of growth that we've had. And, and to, be able to, to be able to get to the next iteration, uh, uh, you really have to focus on making the stack operable. Uh, and, and sometimes that means trading off uh, against everything else. It means trading off against features. It means trading off against giving people leverage. Uh, and it's, it's purely just so that you can actually get to the next iteration by, by keeping it operable. And it's one of those things that you really have to keep in the forefront of your mind because uh, it can easily just creep up and just bite you. Um, people frequently set uh, thresholds on things that are really, really close to the point at which they're going to tip over. <laughs> uh, like uh, Operability means monitoring way, way below that. And the other thing is providing the right tools. And this means asking the users, what tools do you actually need uh, in order to not do what it is that you're currently doing to us? So we have a, a current customer. Uh, they have a system for, for basically looking at all of the alerts that are going off and figuring out the correlation between them, uh, like what they're trying to root cause them, basically. And they do this by actually creating their own system of alerts. Uh, and for us, that means they've created roughly 12,000 of those 27,000 dashboards. And uh, the churn in our state database is about 95% from that particular use case. And it's entirely because what we're doing for them is exactly what they need. But what they need and what we need are not the same thing. And it, it's, it's because we didn't realize fast enough that they were doing that. And uh, at the scale, uh, because you're looking at the like the top line numbers, like uh, how fast am I growing? How much capacity do I need? You're not necessarily focusing on like every single one of the 350 people that might be writing against it, or if I look at the engineering organization, the 3,000 people that might be writing against it. Um, you, you tend to forget that there are like real people out there trying to solve their own problems, and we have way more efficient ways for them to solve it, but they don't ask us first, right? Like, uh, and if they did ask us, that would probably be a bad burden as well. So it, it's on us to make sure that we're asking these questions all the time. So these are some of the uh, principles of the actual system itself. Uh, so I, I mentioned that uh, we're not the only like horse in town, right? Like uh, there are there are other systems out there. We have a data storage. Uh, so so our storage is like singular values. Uh, we are very focused on operational metrics. We don't really focus on business metrics at all. Um, we at the moment don't support multi dimensions. Uh, we have a store that focuses on multi dimensional metrics and business metrics. Um, we have uh, sources of truth for everything that's happening in the company in terms of like deployments, A-B testing, uh, feature rollouts, like all of this kind of thing we have sources of truth for. They're not represented in our data storage. So one of the, one of the things we're trying to get to is being completely neutral about the data sources that we talk to. So when we fetch things from our visualization libraries and from our, our triggering engine, we don't necessarily, we don't actually care where it comes from. We can lay, overlay our business metrics with our operational metrics, with our, uh, with our data source for um, like when things were deployed, and, and reason on them as one uh, mathematical source, basically. So triggers are uh, independent of alerts. And this is something that uh, we realized very, very late, uh, uh, well after the alert system was written. So uh, in our alert system, uh, the action that we take from an alert is relatively heavily coupled to the trigger going off. 
uh, and it can go off for um, basically anything that you can define in a dashboard, but that's still not independence. And you actually want to be able to reason about these things independently. So the person, for example, who is creating 12,000 dashboards to try and figure out these correlation between alerts could do it much more easily if the triggers were all completely independent and we had a system that could combine them. So on this one, it's actually, it's actually important because uh, we want to be able to have triggers on things that are entirely outside of our operational metrics as well. Uh, things that happen directly on a box, business metrics that look a bit off, uh, and then kind of combine the business metric being off with like the, the actual thing being down and then uh, onto this one, alerting as a workflow. It's really important to not think about alerting as this thing that you do just to send you a message that tells you that your, your threshold is fired. It, it, the, the part that we're actually currently missing in our system is engaging people in the workflow so that they don't have to go out and create an order remediation job that's then tied back to their alert as an independent thing. They need to be able to uh, create their order remediation job and tie it back to any combination of triggers that has gone off in the system so that they can say that if a particular business metric is down and this other operational metric is down, then I want to go out and make sure that my entire um, you know, email sending pipeline is healthy or, or, or whatever. So s some of our learnings. A lot of these are, are things to get to our next system. So metadata accumulates over time. Uh, very quickly. So we have a lot of metadata about the data in our system. We have a lot of metadata that's completely and utterly useless, uh, and we have a lot of metadata that's user-generated, like uh, dashboards, computations, uh, triggers, alerts, um, iris plans uh, for who to escalate to. And over time, you end up with uh, not only a lot of this stuff that you don't necessarily need, uh, but the users who are using it are very, very heavily invested in what they've created. If you've spent like, you know, a couple of weeks setting up like perfectly manicured dashboards for all of your services so that you can drill down and you know really understand your system, if we want to, if we say we have this great idea for a new system, we're going to change you to it, and we just throw them. Uh, throw everything they've created over the last uh, you know, five years away, people get very upset very, very fast. And then they start claiming things like, we need the entire system to be working completely 100% before we'll even touch it, which is just not a thing in software engineering, right? Like, uh, people, people like to think that's a thing, but it's, it's, it's really not a thing. <laughs> the learning here is like thinking very carefully about how you're going to migrate to this next big idea, which is, which is actually one of the reasons we don't uptake a lot of, like, of the really like revolutionary concepts. The, the revolutionary concepts for us are coming through series of iteration to get to it, and people might not even realize when they're there. So the other thing is that because the entire system is self-service, multiple points of control are necessary. And this is another one that you don't think of when you're creating the system up front, because adding a lot of these things is uh, a huge burden for small teams. Uh, if, if you're on a small team and you're in a startup and your company is growing very, very fast, the last thing you're thinking of is uh, how am I going to operate at 100 times the scale I was previously? I mean, we're not at 100 times the scale. We're like at 1,000 times the scale now and still growing really, really fast. Um, I mean, we're growing at LinkedIn scale at the moment. We're not even growing at Microsoft scale. When I look at Microsoft scale, it terrifies me. Uh, the, the, the rate of growth across the entire company is, is ridiculous. What we're going to be doing over the next few years and how we're going to get there is something that's like constantly in the back of my mind. So some of the things we've had to implement. So query costing. So this is basically uh, how do I stop my um, API endpoint from falling over uh, when somebody asks me for all of the data on all of the boxes in the entire system, which has happened. Um, and usually when the person is doing that, not only are they asking for all of that data, they're asking for all of that data every minute because for some reason they decided they needed to have all of the data in all of the boxes and all the systems every minute in order to do whatever they were, were trying to do. So, so query costing is really about uh, like early detection of problems and cutting them off uh, before they get there. Uh, so 
uh, it's good for us, and it's, it's actually really good for the users. Uh, like, a user doesn't want to find out that they took down the entire monitoring stack by accident, right? Like, that's just, that's unacceptable for them, it's unacceptable for us. Uh, and they feel really bad, and we don't like making our users feel bad. Um, API keys are, are related to this. So API keys are actually something we don't have except in Iris. And API keys are something we really need everywhere uh, because API keys are like our last fallback when we can't figure out like what is happening, but we know it's this particular user. Uh, you know, it's it's better to cut off like like a leg or an arm <laughs> than like lose the entire body, right? Um, so ingestion control. Uh, ingestion throttles are, are basically the, the inbound metrics into our system. Uh, so we have uh, blacklists, we have uh, whitelists. Uh, what we don't have yet is rate controls. And, uh, and this is kind of like another fallback for us to, to be able to say, like, the system is just going to fall over unless we can, like, throttle it right back uh, right now. Uh, somebody created a dynamic metric uh, that was a lambda function in Java, and the name of the metric was the memory signature of the lambda function. That was awesome, because uh, um, like literally every time the lambda function executed, which was many, 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 many thousands of times a second, uh, we got a new metric. Uh, we ran out of storage like everywhere uh, really fast. So at the moment, we don't have variable retention. Uh, and uh, in our new system, we do have variable retention. So uh, variable retention is basically because um, some people care a lot about having two years of data for something. Uh, it, it might be, um, tell me my cluster health for the last you know, two years uh, at a very high aggregate level uh, so that I can look at like trends. How did I do two years ago? Like, What's my rate of growth? Uh, uh, capacity planning, it's important to have a reasonably long time frame. Other things, you don't really care. Like some things, honestly, you probably care about having like a day of data. Um, uh, people care actually more about having multiple weeks of data than you would think because uh, sometimes it's nice to go, oh, I just discovered this problem. Wait, it actually started happening three weeks ago and that entire thing's been down for three weeks. Uh, that actually happens also more than you would think. And kind of related to this is cost reporting. So uh, being able to say to a customer, hey, I know you think these metrics are really, really important, but those metrics of yours are literally costing us a million dollars a year is, is really, really important. Because at the end of the day, we don't actually care as a team how much it costs uh, to store metrics or how much, uh, how much data we're storing or how fast we're growing as long as we can sustain the rate of growth. What we care about is that people are accountable for what they're doing. If a particular feature is making us you know, a billion dollars a year, we don't actually care if it's costing us 500,000 a year in metrics. Like, I mean, maybe we could be a bit more efficient, but it's not, it's, it's not something that we really need to think about because, I mean, let's face it, engineers are also very expensive. So, you know, like, uh, sub-optimizing on some of these things isn't necessarily what we want to do. So basically, just ask early, uh, you know, what can you do at 100 times your current scale? How are you going to get there? Like, have you actually thought about that? Because uh, it's way easier to fix some of these things like uh, five years ago than it is to fix them now. The challenge here, uh, optimizing uh, the needs of the many uh, while making life bearable for the, li for the, for the few. So this is basically uh, the biggest challenge of any kind of tools team. This is basically global optima versus local optima. Everybody wants to solve for their local problem. Uh, as the tools team, it's your job to solve for you know, everybody's problem uh, in the best way possible. And uh, the, the way that I've actually found that's the easiest to solve this is to try and tackle the most difficult of the use cases first. And it doesn't necessarily mean solving the entire use case, but when you start breaking it down and actually looking at like the the nitty gritty, uh, you you find that like often the most difficult use cases are the people who are most vocal and causing you the most support burden. And uh, once you start solving for these people, not only do, does their life get a lot better, but a lot of these problems are actually the same problems that everybody in the company is facing, just on a slightly different, uh, in a different way. And solving the big problems sometimes solves a lot of the smaller problems as well. This is actually probably the hardest 
uh, challenge in any tools organization. Uh, it's, it's worse than scaling, it's worse than everything. As the company grows, uh, the amount of disconnect that you get from your users increases as well, and, and maintaining that connective tissue and uh, really understanding what their problems are and actually solving for them, that's, that's actually uh, almost a bigger challenge than the technical ones. I love the technical challenges. Like, uh, like solving technical challenges is, is like absolutely fun. This is not fun. Uh, this, is, this is hard work <laughs> and requires a lot of, uh, a lot of relationship maintenance. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it, it's good. Uh, and at the end of the day, people, people enjoy the tools and actually get a lot more out of the system. So. I actually don't have anything more, but uh, if people have questions, then shoot. So we actually do lazy retention in our new system. So uh, uh, this actually causes two problems. So the, the first problem is lazy retention is good, but uh, because it means that you can optimize in batches actually deleting things. The, the problem is that uh, people get really confused uh, if you tell them that their data is going to be there for two months because that's the default or whatever, uh, and their data is mostly there for four months because you haven't deleted it because you're waiting for the high watermark to happen. Uh, you're, you're kind of in this like uh, challenge of uh, do I tell them that actually, do I just cut it off at two months and pretend that the other two months doesn't exist, or do I give it to them? And so. Uh, yeah, so, so we actually have it configured globally. Uh, it's configured on a, uh, mm, I actually can't remember, I think it's configured by tags, uh, but um, yeah, and it's lazy, like super, super lazy. Uh, it only deletes when it hits a high watermark. Okay, yeah, so, so the part of the workflow you're talking about, we call RUM, real user metrics. Uh, so that's basically emitted from the browser, uh, from, a JavaScript engine on the browser. It sends it down to an uh, incredibly high QPS uh, endpoint. Uh, and then we, uh, that comes in through Kafka. It's, um, it's accumulated in SAMSA and uh, put back into Kafka. And then those metrics end up in Pino, which is our multi-dimensional store, uh, which is not in that workflow because that's not in my team. Uh, so that's, that's actually one of the stores that we want to access because accessing the real user uh, monitoring is um, uh, actually way, way more useful than I think we're currently using it for. At the moment, we use it for user experience monitoring. We use it for uh, monitoring on site speed, things like that. But what we don't use it for is um, like send me an alert if 90% of my users are suddenly finding the website slow. Uh, we, we do that entirely uh, either from external monitoring or we do it from the metrics that we collect. Uh, so actually being able to access that through our engine and uh, add alerts to it so that you can actually say, you know, if 90% of my users think the website's slow, I probably want to know about that. Um, so yeah, it, it doesn't actually, it is not in that workflow because it's not in my team.